if we know more about bumblebees, this will be good. Ah, oh, somebody's remembered to press this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. <laughs> there are going to be several people trying to host this meeting. Right. Um, so um, could I ask everybody to mute themselves while Jill's talking? The meeting will be recorded, so that, um, but we need to stop the recording whenever a video comes on because the videos are covered by copyright. So you'll see a box appear every now and again. Um, saying this is going to be recorded or whatever. So please ignore that. Um, without any further ado, okay. I'd like to hand over to Jill so that she can share her um, screen and do a presentation. Thank you. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, I will rely on Elizabeth to tell me if anything goes wrong. But very, very delighted to be here this evening. I think there are a few more important issues than communicating to society, to our future generations, why protecting nature matters. And for me, obviously, as CEO of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, it's why pollinators matter and why bumblebees matter in particular. So all of you on here, I'm delighted to talk to some beekeepers. Um, I, I meet loads of you all, all through my working life, um, but it's been a long time since I've actually done a presentation to one. So it's a very warm welcome. If I was in a room with you now, I would all make sure you put up your hands and somebody tell me what species of bumblebee this is. But as you're not, I can't test you. Uh, it's actually a white-tailed bumblebee, and it's uh, a female because we know it's a female because it's collecting pollen and it's got pollen baskets. So a little bit about the trust to start. The trust was started in 2006. Uh, a lot of you will know about Professor Dave Goulson. Uh, he and his PhD student Ben Darville did a lot of research during the early 2020s and found out that bumblebees are in serious decline. We'd already lost two to extinction. We've got two at risk, the great yellow bumblebee and the shrill carder bee, and we've got six on the at risk register. The declines of these wonderful creatures uh, started just after the second world war when we lost 97% of our wildflower meadows. And that was the beginning of the declines. Now, again, I would have tested you had I been in the room and said, what's this bumblebee? This is, actually, <laughs> this is actually my most favorite bumblebee. It's a bilberry bumblebee, a Bombus monticola, and it's found in upland areas. And it's an absolute beauty. And if you go on holiday to the Peak District or Yorkshire Dales, this is the bee to look out for. It's really a stunner. So I'm gonna start off with a, a short story, really. Uh, a bit of an apocryphal story, but there's an element of truth to it. So there's um, some very vast areas in China uh, where they grow thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of pears and apples and fruit trees and plums. And over the years and decades, they've sprayed off the bugs that they don't want to, to destroy their crops. But unfortunately, in doing so, they've also um, decimated the pollinators. And so they're there now having to pollinate some of their areas by hand. And you think that this perhaps just couldn't possibly happen in the UK. Well, not many people know that we actually import 65,000 boxes of commercially farmed bumblebees into this country every year, and they underpin our soft fruit industry. And I'll talk a little bit more. This is a global industry uh, and for our international um, audience here today. It happens in America as well. Um, it's a global issue bringing these, bringing these bees in, but we absolutely need them because of the decline and because in some cases this bee is the only bee that can pollinate flowers of a particular crop. And the particular crop is tomatoes. Now, to, now bees and flowers have co-evolved over the years together. And the tomato flower actually doesn't have any nectar. It holds its, its uh, pollen tightly in the anther. And the only way to release that pollen is by a vibration. And I've got a very short video. Uh, and Elizabeth, if you would like to stop recording. I head the thorax and 
Sorry, Elizabeth. Yes, I'll start again. So when we talk about the bumblebee, we talk about its head, it's got a, a thorax, and it's got an abdomen. And what's very special about the bumblebee is it's got an enormous amount of muscles in its thorax. And it has a very clever way of disconnecting its wings from those muscles and vibrating those muscles. And it can vibrate those muscles at exactly 400 hertz. And that's what opens up the anthers uh, to release the pollen from the tomato. The uh, horticultural farmers uh, import the bumblebees specifically because they get a better quality fruit or uh, a better pollination rate through using bumblebees. So I always put this one up because we have to think about why we, why we should care about the declining bumblebees. Of course, we're all here. We know we should care about them. Pollinators are really important. There was some very clever scientists uh, at Reading University, uh, uh, Professor Simon Potts, and he and his team worked out how much it would cost this country if we lost all our pollinators. And it was in the region of 691 million. In the States, uh, I think the uh, pollination, uh, global pollination economy is, is estimated at US dollars about 235 to 577 million. It's an enormous amount of, of money. So if we lost all our pollinators, uh, we'd have to somehow find a different way of pollinating all our foods. And everybody immediately thinks of, of, of the fruit and the vegetables that are pollinated. But when you think about cows, and I know grass is wind pollinated, but it isn't just grass they feed on. They feed on all the herbs and, and clovers that are in that pasture. And all of those have to be pollinated. So even our dairy products are dependent, the quality of our dairy products are dependent on pollination. And also the creatures that rely on the results of pollination, all the shrews and the birds and the plants. So we call, we, pollination is, a, is what's called an ecosystem service. It's culturally important. It's the way our gardens look, the colors in our gardens, the flowers in our gardens, uh, the way our soil is protected. Everything is dependent on that, on our pollinators. And uh, they estimated that honeybees um, produce 10 to 30 million, but I think that's probably- Perfect, you big red ones today? I think somebody's come off mute. Oh no, they're back on mute again, lovely. So a little bit about the work of the trust. So we uh, have sort of three themes to our work. One is um, restoration and creation of habitat. So we work across the United Kingdom. And these are just a few of the, the projects that are ongoing at the moment. We tend to work with farmers and landowners uh, local authorities, anybody really who's got a bit of land, where there are our rarest bees, uh, because we don't want those to go extinct. So those are the, the sort of areas that we, we focus on. So habitat provision is our main thread, and we've, we're a science-based evidence-led charity, so we work very closely with universities doing research, making sure that our conservation work uh, really inspires uh, landowners uh, to, to take it forward. And some of the work that we've done on some with some some of the, the farmers that we've worked on. We also uh, do do work with the government. We're what's called trusted advisors to the government. So we sit on the pollinator advisory steering groups for all of the devolved countries. Um, I think the English one is just about coming to an end and we, we really need to um, work a bit harder on getting that uh, redone. The best plan, if you're interested in looking at the pollinator plan, the absolute best one is the All Island Pollinator Plan. And the resources on their website are second to none. They are really, really good. And public engagement. For me, you know, increasing public understanding and awareness about bumblebees. And it was lovely to hear, Elizabeth, you say at the beginning that, you know, you ought to, as beekeepers, you ought to know about other bees. Uh, I think that's really important. When I go into schools and there are those lovely children sat there and I do an assembly and I'll say to them, what do you know about bees? They only know two things. They sting and they make honey. That's it. 
And I would really, you know, in the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we really want people to to learn not to be afraid of bees, because I think there is a lot of fear around bees, the fact that they sting. Um, but I, I think it's really important for, for our food security alone, for uh, children in particular, our next generation, to become fond or even love bees, whether it's solitary bees, bumblebees or honeybees. And obviously we, we provide information. So on our website, we have a lot of free resources, both curriculum for, curriculum for schools and also for landowners and farmers. And you can download and use any of that information. As I said earlier, we're a science-based organization. So it's really important that we continue to do research on bees. And we do research on all bees, honeybees, as well as bumblebees because there's a lot of crossover work that we do, particularly on pathology and parasites that may go from one species to another. But it's really important that we keep that research going because as, if we can take the research and put it into practice, uh, then we will help more bees on the way. And obviously, if we're creating habitat for bumblebees, honeybees are obviously going to benefit as well. Likewise, if you're creating habitat for your honeybees, our bumblebees should, unless they're outcompeted by your honeybees. <laughs> so I would have asked you again, I said, I would have tested you again and said, what's this bee? And I hope you're all screaming at your screens, that's a white-tailed bumblebee, Jill. Yes, it is. It's a white-tailed bumblebee. So a little bit about the ecology of bumblebees, hymenoptera order. They're social insects like your honeybees, so they live in colonies, much smaller colonies. Um, they're obviously flower visitors. And we like to say that they're very hard working pollinators. I know your honeybees don't work, they work within a sort of temperature range. Whereas my bees, they're out on frosty mornings. They don't go to bed until very late. So we, we, we tend to think they're slightly more hard working than, than honeybees because they can, uh, they can manage extreme temperatures. They actually evolved in the Himalayas. That's why they have their big thick furry coat. Uh, and that's why they can come out when it's much colder. And certainly in the spring on very cold days when the queens are emerging, you may see them lying on the grass shivering and that's them building up their body temperature again by that vibration of their thorax muscles. So Elizabeth said there's about 270, nobody really knows. We think there's around about 250 species of bee, 25 bumblebees, 100 honeybee, but you know, we have no idea how many solitary bees there are. And if you want a good presentation on solitary bees, a UK leader on solitary bees, he's, he's fantastic. Uh, and obviously, you know, all bees get nectar from flowers and protein rich pollen for growth and bumblebees have uh, an annual life cycle. Now this slide goes in because I don't often present to, bum to beekeepers, but it's just to try and start people understanding. I don't like using the word that, that honeybees are domesticated but it's a word we use to differentiate from bumblebees, which are wild and not looked after by anybody, particularly, you know, so we call beekeepers, uh, bee farmers, if you like, they, you know, you look after them. Um, some of you with good maths will see that there's 18 social species and six cuckoo species, and that's 24. And I've told you that there was 25 bumblebees. Well, we tried to reintroduce an extinct bumblebee, the short-haired bumblebee, back into Dungeness. Uh, it's been a 10-year project, five years bringing it over from Sweden and five years monitoring it. Uh, we haven't found it yet, so we don't know whether we've been successful. But that project has meant an has been an enormous success oh. for all the other rare bumblebees. There's been an enormous win for, for rare bumblebees in that area. So uh, your lovely, your honeybees do the waggle dance. Mine don't dance, but bumblebees have smelly feet. So they, 
it takes an awful lot of energy for the bee to, to fly and land. And when they do land on a flower, they leave a little pheromone scent on the petal. And when the next bumblebee comes along, it'll smell that, it'll know that the pollen and nectar has been recently taken from that plant, and therefore it'll fly and won't bother trying to land there. So um, that's one of the, the surprising and wonderful things about it. For, for ours, only the queen survives the winter. I think yours, uh, so your colony can go on for a number of years. The main reason for bumblebees decline, and I'll come on to more of their declines later, is due to flower loss. Uh, and I know that your hives are badly affected by diseases. Uh, uh, Varroa has been uh, particularly bad over the centuries. So would you like to stop recording because this is a little video about bumblebee flies. Hey, we're getting good at this. So if I was in a room with you now, I would give you a demonstration of how a bumblebee flies with a figure of eight uh, motion. But it's really, really, you begin to you begin to love bumblebees, aren't you, if you didn't already? They are fascinating creatures. And I only just scraped the surface uh, on this presentation. So a little bit about the bumblebee life cycle. So this is uh, the queen who's emerged in the springtime. If the, she's been pre-mated the year before, she goes into hibernation. So they emerge sometime around February, March, depending on the weather. And the first thing she does is feed. So uh, the, the pussy willow, the salix flower is absolutely perfect. Those big golden pollen soaked uh, willows are absolutely perfect for her. But that's why it's really important to have something flowering during that springtime when, when they emerge. And sometimes when they emerge, you will also see big queens, they always get stuck in conservatories, but also zigzagging very low over the grass. And that's her using her antennae to smell out somewhere to nest. And a lot of people say to me, um, how can I get a bumblebee to nest in my garden? And I say, grow a nut tree. If you grow a nut tree, the little voles and the shrews will come in and the mice, might not want them in your garden, but they will make a nest, which they then abandon, and then the, the bumblebee will move in. And the bumblebee likes the smell of, uh, it recognises the smell, so the smell of, of rodents material. So once she's fed up, uh, she'll find a nest, and she will um, make a mound of pollen. And then she'll extrude a little bit of wax from her abdomen and with her mandibles, she'll fashion it into the most gorgeous little pot. It's about the size of a thimble. And if you ever find a bumblebee nest, you'll find this little cup that she's made. And in that cup, she'll put nectar. So once she's filled the little pot with nectar and she's got a mound of pollen, she'll then lay her eggs and she will have to brood those eggs for five to six days. So while she's in there brooding her eggs, she will uh, be feeding out of the nectar pot and, and the pollen mound. Now, like most insects, once the eggs are hatched, so it goes eggs, larvae, pupa, and then you get the adults. And so come, it depends on the species, the early bumblebee will have this going in March, whereas some of our later emerging bumblebees won't, won't be in this position till June. But the, the new baby bumblebees are all girls. And the girls will do all the work. They will go out and bring home pollen. They will brood the eggs. They'll look after the queen. They'll keep the nest clean. So they'll do everything. And they are the workers. And they're the girls. Later on in the season, the queen will lay unfertilized eggs. And those unfertilized eggs are males. And the males uh, will leave the nest. And they do two things. They get drunk and they have sex. That's about it for male bumblebees. <laughs> I can see Rowan is pleased by that. <laughs> and on a summer's morning, you may find a bumblebee splayed out on a, on a flower head. It will be a male. And you can handle males quite happily, A, because they're dopey, and B, because they don't have a sting, because the sting on the female is part of the ovipositor, the egg laying mechanism. So the males will be they'll just leave the nest they don't do anything else and they'll hunt around for another nest to hang around because they don't want to have sex with their sisters so they'll find another nest later on in the season a little bit later the queen will lay 
new eggs and those new eggs will be the new queens. And the new queens will emerge, they'll mate with the, the males and then the whole colony dies uh, apart from the new queen that will go into hibernation and then the cycle all starts again. Everybody wants, all the men want to come back as a male bumblebee now, don't they? <sighs> Can I just ask, Jill, uh, is the Queen nest-bound for that whole period, or does she leave? You know, she is nest-bound for most of that period. She might leave once or twice, but generally speaking, no, she stays in the nest. Um, we do ID training days, uh, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a very brief overview of if you were interested in learning to identify bumblebees, what you should look for. So we have the big six, really common and widespread bumblebees. You will find all of these in your garden. And the first thing to do is look at their bottoms. What's the color of their bottom? Um, and then you can look at the number of stripes they have and where those stripes are, whether they're on the thorax and the abdomen or just on the abdomen. And these six are very, well, the common carder bee is very easy to identify because it's all ginger. Um, and the red-tailed bumblebee is generally very easy to identify as well. It's more difficult between the buff tail and the white tail, but the garden bumblebee is very significant because it has quite a long, it has a very long tongue, so it has quite a long head, um, and it's very distinctive, the garden bumblebee. This little early bumblebee can be very tiny. Uh, it can be the size of the nail on your thumb. It's a uh, very tiny, tiny bee, but it's the first one that comes out. And then we have the big seven. Now the story is that this bee came over from France in the boot of Dave Goulson's car. I'm sure that's not true. We used to call it the ooh -la -la bee because it came over from France, um, but then we renamed it the tree bumblebee. And this is the one you beekeepers are most familiar with, I think, because their nests in, uh, they've exploited a niche our native bumblebees don't do, and that's they nest up high in trees or in bird boxes or under eaves or something. And they're very much an urban bee. And this bee, unlike our native bees, which are quite benign, this bee can, can look quite aggressive. And certainly, um, when the uh, queens are being uh, emerging from the nest, the tree bumblebee swarm, the males swarm outside uh, and it can look a bit scary. But this map is well out of date now. It's right up. It's done amazingly well. It's right up through Scotland. It's over in Ireland. It is an amazing bee. And again, very distinctive and very easy to identify. Oh, would you like to turn it off? I've got another little video where I don't know about you but I <laughs> thank you Elizabeth again I don't know about you but I'm of an age where you know we used to use the term I'm going to make a bee line to that we must have known that bees fly in dead straight lines um, even before that experiment but fascinating experiment um, so a little bit about why bees are declining as I said you know our countryside used to look like this uh, we had loads of wildflower meadows uh, Today, we have a lot of monoculture. Now, I'm very pro-farmers. We work very closely with farmers. Uh, all of the farmers we work to are understanding about how they need to, to keep wildlife on their farms and keep pollinators on their farm. Uh, all, most of our projects are working with farmers across the country. However, we do understand that it's a really difficult balancing act. Uh, and it's a very complex subject, which I won't go into today because I'll get on my soap soapbox about food waste and um, the cost of food. But we do have a culture of cheap food and there's so many different pressures from supermarkets and uh, others on, on farmers. It makes it difficult you know, to, to make a cohesive, coherent argument for it. But it is true that intensive agriculture over the last 60, 70 years has has meant that uh, our bees are declining. And of course, neonicotinoids, this is a, a favorite one, isn't it? Um, and I'd like to say before we start off that this is for me, neonicotinoids a little bit like bayonetting the wound. The wound was made when we lost 97% of our wildflower meadows. Neonicotinoids came into play in the 1990s. By that time, our wild bees 
are in serious decline. So this was just another thing that didn't help with the with with just you know made the declines even worse. It's a really important thing. It's a, it's a really sad state of affairs that uh, the government has allowed uh, a derogation for the neonics on sugar beet now. Um, however, it, it has played its part, but it's not particularly bee killing. It has a sublethal effect on bumblebees. I'm not quite sure what it does on honeybees, but it reduces their capacity to, to feed their colony and find their way back to the nest. It's a nasty thing anyway. Uh, and here we are with imported bumblebees. And this was one of our first successes really, because it was non-natives being imported into this country. Uh, they weren't being screened for the particular parasites that might be bad for our native bumblebees. So we worked with uh, a professor, Peter Greystock, uh, on um, asking Natural England to tighten up the licensing and allow only native bees to be farmed and brought into this country and also to in in increase the viral screening. And I have one last video. So do you want to stop? But you can keep... Oh, I was going to say... Keep yeah, this one's okay. This one's our, ours. Oh, I'll just go back. My name is Peter Greystock and I use cutting edge molecular techniques to explore the effect parasites can have on vital pollinators like bumblebees. There are over 250 species of bumblebee and many have been showing declines for decades. It's likely that the introduction of parasites from commercially imported bumblebees may play a role in this. Bumblebees are imported on an industrial scale to help pollinate a number of important crops. But my PhD research showed that these commercially reared bumblebees were often infected with parasites upon arrival into the UK. If these parasites are passed onto native populations, they can cause serious harm. Through my research with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, I developed methods using DNA technology to detect if the parasites in imported bees could pose a risk to our native bumblebee and honeybees. In response to my findings, Natural England will no longer allow non-native bumblebees to be imported into the UK from 2015, a policy which will significantly reduce the risk posed to native bees. Norway has also banned imports outright until suppliers can prove their bees are no longer infected. Further funding from NERC and Natural England has allowed me to start developing a screening process which could be used by those breeding and importing pollinators. This would ensure excellent standards of parasite detection across the industry. Detecting and understanding the harm parasites pose to pollinators has been pivotal in changing bumblebee import regulations, improving standards across the industry and increasing public awareness of the role bumblebees play in nature and in agriculture. So we're still working with Peter Greystock. He's still working on some of the, the research, particularly on the parasites that come in and on these uh, bees that are that are commercially farmed. Um, I don't think you can tell what species of bumblebee that is, but I think it's a buff tail and it's on a lovely tomato flower. So the positive stuff is that we can all do something to help bumblebees. This is a common carder bee. Um, Gardening is the big thing, uh, and I'm sure you guys know that everybody started growing bee-friendly flowers um, right through the flight season, right through from March to September or October even, or down here where I am, you know, all year round. It's difficult to find something flowering all year round, but um, it is important that gardens can feed our bees all year. Uh, these are just some of, the, some of the plants again, you know, the alliums, the, the herbs, the lavenders. Obviously, 
this was something that we worked with a, a local authority who's had a huge park that was closely mown grass. And we just suggested to them that they put a margin in of wildflowers. And there was a bit of ooing and ahhing about it, but eventually they did it. It's been so well received by the local community. And it's so brilliant to see the insect life in this just put a management plan together uh, and it's been absolutely brilliant and it's continued to flower uh, year on year. And this was uh, one of the pictorial meadows. This was at a school where they just wanted something beautiful for one of their open days. So we said these uh, and the kids afterwards could go in there and collect the seed from these and, and learn how to collect and dry seed and take it on for the next year. We don't care what plants they are, so long as they feed the bees. Now, these lovely flowers. So we ask people not to plant or grow these. Uh, so these have been hybridized for their color and they actually contain no pollen or nectar. And I think these bedding plants, if you go into a, a nursery or garden center and, and watch where the bees are feeding, you will find that none are feeding on this. So we, we ask people to avoid buying. Uh, bedding plants. We have a, a really rather wonderful tool on our website, completely free. It's called Be Kind. It's got over 700 of the best bee friendly flowers. You can uh, sift it by month, you can sift it by color, by number of petals, by shade, by sun, by soil type. Uh, it's an amazing tool. It was uh, funded by one of the charitable foundations that fund us. Uh, and it's been the most amazing thing. And it will it will score your garden for bee friendliness. And then it will give you 10 more plants that you could plant in order to enhance as well. As I say, it's all free. It's a, it's a brilliant tool. I highly recommend it. So every year, every day, every month, if somebody wants to talk to me about bumblebees or I'm walking down the street or having a coffee in the local coffee shop, they'll say, how are the bees doing, Jill? And I would not be able to answer that question without Bee Walk. So this is core to all our work. So in 2010, we set up Bee Walk, which is a, a, a where we can train people to identify bumblebees, they set a transect, they walk it once a month, they collect the data on what bumblebees they see and on what flowers they're feeding. We started off with about 35 bee walkers, we've now got over 700. And that, that data that they collect, they're all volunteers, they're all volunteer bee walkers, that data is absolutely vital for us because it tells us whether our interventions are working, uh, how the bees are doing that data and on our website you can look up our latest bee walk which gives you information about all our bumblebees and where in the country uh, they're doing well and where they're not it's an, a really really important survey as I said core to all our work without bee walk we would not be able to determine whether our charitable objective which is to reverse the decline in bumblebees is actually working so if you want to become a bee walker, we can we can give you a BID training and you can set your transect. I, I have a transect where I walk each day just along the seawall and background. You can choose where you want it, but really, really important to us. And then how can you help children? You know, I do think that children somehow have become really frightened of bees. I don't know why or where it's developed from. Uh, obviously leave a legacy, but that's probably all going to be keeping places, charities. You can volunteer, garden, make us, if some of you work for corporates, make us charity of the year, ask a friend, support our campaigns. You know, there's a thousand things you can do. But I think the biggest one for me, and I've put it at the top, is just talk to children about how wonderful bees are. And I'm sure as beekeepers, you have nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, that you do that too now. But if you can talk to them, if they can talk to their friends about how wonderful bees are, that would be brilliant. Uh, if I was in a room with you now, I'd lock the doors and tell you nobody could leave until you've joined us. We're only 25 pound a year. How could you not? They're such wonderful creatures. 
And Jane Goodall is a bit of a heroine of mine. Um, I think each day we can do something to help somewhere along the way. And that's it. It's a goodbye from me and a goodbye from her. Isn't that a lovely picture? I don't know whether anybody's got any, any questions, Elizabeth. Well, can I just start by saying thank you very much. Thank you for your inspiring talk. And I completely agree. Our job is to go out and talk to people and to talk about bees, all bees. All bees, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to talk, to, to sort of explain about the importance of bees and the wonderfulness of bees. And, yeah. and solitary yeah. bees are equally wonderful, you know. You know, the leaf cutter bees, the, the mason bees, they're all fascinating in their own way. And the way they make nests and things is, is brilliant. So, yes, I'm absolutely with you. We, the whole, we, we all need to go out and talk to more people to, to sell be the concept of the biodiversity that we have in this country and the need to look after all the bees. Mm. Uh, right, so does anybody have any questions? Can I, um, I, I've got you all on mute, I think, at the moment, but if anybody's got any questions, just unmute yourself and fire away. Does anybody have a question? Hello, Jill. Hello, who's Hi. that? Um, what's the latest science on pollinator competition? Be for instance, between large colonies, large numbers of colonies of honeybees in an area with bumblebees and solitary bees? Yeah, it's a really, really useful question. So we are doing some research on competition at the moment. I don't know whether you remember back in April last year, Marks and Spencer's sent out um, a bit of public relations, they thought, where they were going to put uh, 50 million bees on their farms. And there was a huge backlash from the conservation societies and the wild bee experts. And we uh, have a policy on our website. We have a, a, a position statement about honeybees versus bumblebees. And we always say, we always ask, and we work closely with bee, beekeepers, that if you're going to position hives uh, near where there might be rare bees, um, then your bees would likely outcompete our rarer ones. However, having said that, most of our rarer bees are the long-tongued bees. And those are the ones that like the really old fashioned flowers like foxgloves and borage and comfrey and uh, those sorts and, and dead nettles, white dead nettle in particular. And it's those sorts of flowers that our rarer bees tend to feed on. Um, but there's more research being done at the moment on competition with, with honeybees competing with, with our wild bees. Uh, I haven't got that to hand at the moment, but I can certainly, if you look on our website, you'll find the information there on our, if you go and look for our position statement on honeybees versus bumblebees, you'll find it there. But it is, it is true that in some cases, if there's not enough forage, honeybees will outcompete wild bees. Thank you. Thank you. Very good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Jill, it's Nick. Thank, thanks for that. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by the commercial bee, bee side of this business and first picked it up on a book called The History of Bees, which is a great novel if some if guys haven't read it. Where, where can I find out more? What about commercially farmed bumblebees? Yeah. yeah, not that I want to commercially farm them, but bringing bees into the country and moving them around just to pollinate yeah. specific. It, it's, it's hard. I mean, um, the two main producers of commercially farmed bumblebees are Biobest and Coppert. And you could start by looking at their website. Now, Dave Goulson uh, wanted to do some research on this, and he asked if he could go over to their um, factories in, in Europe. And they were very loath to let him go over there, as you can probably imagine. But he has written a book, uh, The Sting in the Tail, and he does talk about uh, them there. 
we uh, we tried to get some funding we did a um we wanted to do a um a sort of um pre thinking about whether it was possible to do it in this country and we got some initial funding from the leader organization we were working with Leeds university but we just couldn't we just couldn't see how it makes it worse if you think about it nick you know the bees feed on two things nectar and pollen yeah now nectar is easy sugar so you can replace sugar or you can place the nectar with sugar but you can't there is no synthetic substitute for pollen so if you're going to farm bumblebees where are you going to get that pollen from now what they do is because they've got vast huge areas out there um they put the sliders on the uh, honeybee hives so that when the honeybees go in it pulls the pollen off their legs the pollen is then sterilized and fed to the bumblebees how bizarre is that <laughs> also so down in California, I was reading with some of the almond trees and stuff, they kill all the bees, the local bees, and then they import the white ones. So they get the right, right level of uh, pollen. It's madness. The whole world has gone mad. I, I think it's complete madness, you know, and, and, and when people, you know, and some go. Garden centres actually sell these boxes of bumblebees as something for your garden. And I, and I say to people, look, if you want bumblebees to nest in your garden, just grow more flowers. That's, that's, you know, that's the simplest thing to do. Just grow more flowers. And a walnut tree. We've got one of them. So I yeah, get the walnut trees in. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. We were contacted by a lady who'd bought um, a bumblebee nest from um, Sutton Seeds, I think it was, for her son for a year. And she, she contacted us because, well, they died off over winter. So she'd had to buy another set. And how could she stop them from dying off over winter? And it just struck me that Sutton, the people selling this bee house with bees had just come up with an excellent sales pitch. Oh. Every year they die. Every year you have to buy some more. I, I, I but, 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 what, you know, that. and those bees may have have parasites yes, that was, might be infecting. Bringing them into Petersfield uh, just because oh, uh, it's, it's complete madness. I, I do. I despair sometimes, but uh, but there we are. Uh, less less of a it's um, down as Sheila Phelps, but uh, mm -hmm. it's. A joint, um, less of a question, more of a sort of a, a statement on the lines that you were talking about. Uh, some years ago, we went to Lacey, um, which is the laboratory for Epicure and Social Insects, and they were doing a, a, an interesting study in conjunction with uh, uh, the Brighton, because they've got these large lawned areas and they managed to persuade them to let it go and not mow it and put paths through. But more especially, they did a survey with the local population and the visitors. So you ended up with the what was originally a bare grassland being let, just nothing added to it, no wildflowers added to it, just left to grow of its own accord. And they would only mow around some of the edges and strips down there. And it was obviously very good for the wildlife, uh, the insect life. But what was stunning was the people who visited and um, regular visitors to the parkland loved it. And the children loved it because they had paths which were just mown to walk around. And this exactly is the piece you, you talked about, talking about the, um, the local council to put a um, a strip, uh, and this was a bit bigger, and um, the, the people loved the result, yeah. and of course the council, it was cheaper. What was surprising is that the, the flowers, the seeds, actually, how long they've been there, finally had a chance to sprout. And yeah, I know, I think it's a lovely story, and it's so true, and we work with, very closely with Plant Life, the conservation charity, on No Mo May, where we try and persuade people not to mow but um we've annexed some land from the council uh, just up my street here there was a, a 
a grassy triangle, which is now a wildflower triangle and then there's another triangle uh, and we'd literally if you just mow it and let it go the seeds the seeds are there in the seed bed and they will come up it's it's so much better for the Again, bees it's education it's getting people to understand that you're, they're going to have all sorts of interesting hawks bits mouse ears oh. cat's ears and all the wonderful names of them but they're not going to get poppies and no. <laughs> so trying to explain the difference between a, a perennial one and an, a, an annual one but yeah. the wonderfulness is that they've got such lovely names which implies that they've been wildflowers for so long that yeah. really I, I really famous. hope that our younger generation can uh, and I think I see it coming certainly from COP26 um, there is a groundswell of young people who really care about the environment, who are really getting into it now. Um, but that, you know, that fear of nature and fear of bees is one that I think we've just got to work really hard at getting over. Yes, we've all got to go and do a talk at the school. <laughs> Adopt your local school. Good luck with that. <laughs> Else? Yeah, it's great. I should go and have my Horlicks before I go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Are there any final questions? Any more questions that anybody wants to know? Right. OK, well, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Jill for, for the talk, for the inspiration. Um, I can see lots of people clapping. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to do sort of a quick plug for the idea that this this summer, I'm hoping that we're, the beekeepers are going to be able to host a pollinator event in Petersfield. Though I'm still at the moment trying to convince the Petersfield Physic Garden that it would be a good place for us to do it, so that we can go and talk to more people about honeybees and bumblebees and solitary bees. And also, I'd like to do a bit about saying, and this is a wasp and this isn't. Um, oh. So to just try and get things out. So I'm really hopeful that we can help the Bumblebee Conservation Trust with its education, because I do think I agree that oh. education is the key for all of us. Oh. Well, if you need any literature, Elizabeth, just send me your address and I'll send you a few bits of literature that we've got that might be helpful. And okay. a really nice poster of bumblebees as well. Excellent. That's what I have in mind. <laughs> but yeah, so it's the, the, the tr wherever we go during the summer, the beekeepers are generally going off to shows and we always do a, a bit about all of the bees. But really, the most important bit is forage. We've just got to plant so many more flowers. Get, yeah. Stop mowing your grass and look at all the, the bees, bumblebees, butterflies and everything else that loves your unmown lawn. Yeah. Uh, anyway. That's my hobby horse for the moment. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much, Jill. And thank you for no, no problem. It's been a joy. Thank you very okay. much indeed, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.